Very cool. All right. We have on the host of Next Level University, speaker, podcast coach, and entrepreneur, Kevin Palmieri. Welcome to Kowalski Analysis. Thank you you? for having me on, Rob. I very much look forward to our chat here. Yeah. So you're in Massachusetts. I am in Massachusetts. The the leaves are are turning. It's beautiful. My girlfriend and I went leaf peeping this weekend. It leaf is, peeping? Uh, yes. It's a good time to be in Massachusetts right now. Is that like bird watching, but for leaves? Yep. <laughs> nice. Yep. Man, I miss having a girlfriend. You don't do that when you're single. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can, but it wouldn't be the same, you know? <laughs> right. That's, that's one of the benefits of having a girlfriend for me is like, obviously she's the most amazing thing in the world and I'm blessed from that aspect, but she brings up things that I know I would never say that on my own. Like, Oh, I want to go apple picking. I want to go peach picking. Like I would never do that. I'm not very variety driven. So that's another benefit of having somebody who is kind of the opposite of you. Yeah. So you're a Patriots fan. I honestly, believe it or not, I don't really watch football. I, the only thing I watch is mixed martial arts. That's kind of like the only sport I watch, but I would be a Patriots fan if I was a football fan. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not a huge football fan either. I mean, I, I like the Ravens a little bit, but I've intentionally tried not to watch with all the crap going on in the yeah. media right now. Yeah. Same. So, um, yeah, let, let's just dive into it. I know a little bit about your background. So just for anyone out there watching, tell people just, you know, few minute version of your story, uh, how you, got to the point where you're at. I know you did some bodybuilding, you know, you were in the corporate world making a bunch of money. And then at some point you jumped and uh, I just want people to hear that. That's sure. Story. Sure. Yeah. So in 2015, uh, by all outside standards, I had an, any young man's dream life. I had, my girlfriend was a model. I had just done a bodybuilding show. So I was in the best shape of my life. I had a high paying job. I had a brand new car. I had a nice apartment by all outside standards. I was living the dream. Inside, I was actually insecure. I lacked confidence. I wasn't happy with myself. I wasn't driven by purpose. I wasn't living on purpose. So my girlfriend ended up leaving me because I was a shell of myself. I was depressed. I was anxious. And this is still, her and I are on good terms. Like, I'm glad she did this. This is what needed to happen. But when she left for the first time in a long time, I actually looked in the mirror and said, like, you're not nearly as happy as everybody around you thinks or as you're putting off. Like everybody thinks I'm happy. I'm really not. So for me, I had to look into the mirror and realize I am insecure. I am afraid of social interactions. I'm afraid of all these things. So when she left, um, that was the end of 2015. Beginning of 2016, I started doing affirmations. This was my initial dive into personal development. I said, I am handsome. I am talented. I am smart. This year, I'm going to make the most money I have ever made in my entire life. Unfortunately, Rob, I really focused on that last one, making the most money I had ever made in my entire life. So I got promoted to a foreman at the construction company I was working for. Uh, we traveled up and down the East Coast of the United States. By the end of that year, out of the 12 months, I had been on the road for 10. Every single week, hotel to hotel, driving four and a half to five hours uh, to New Jersey to driving 14 hours to Virginia, to New York, to Connecticut. I'm always on the road, always on the road, every single week. Thing is, I loved it because I was making anywhere from you know 60 to $120 an hour. I'm all in on that. That's amazing. So I get to the end of the year. I'm sitting at my kitchen table, very similar to what I'm doing here. And I open up my pay stub, my last pay stub of the year. Did I make six figures at 26 with no college degree before any of my friends? Yes, I did but I had another one of these mirror moments of nothing changed. Again, nothing changed. You put all of your happiness into external validation and you're still insecure. You still don't like yourself. You're still not confident. You're still living by accident. So when I went to bed that night, um, I realized as I was laying in bed that it doesn't matter what car you drive. It doesn't matter who's laying in bed next to you. It doesn't matter what you did today or what you're doing tomorrow. The only thing that matters is up here. The only thing that matters is is in your brain. And then I created the Hyperconscious Podcast, which is now Next Level University. But that was like a real shift for me because I finally found podcasting. I love it. I love podcasting. We just crossed 467 episodes. Like it's my life. I love it. But when I started it, I was still traveling. I was on the road every single week. So that thing that made me all this money now took away from my dreams. Mm -hmm. Every single week, it's harder to record when you're in a crusty hotel in New Jersey somewhere, right? It's not easy. So I literally, I was at this crossroads. And every week, I would either call out, I'd leave the job early, 
or I'd literally, it got to the point where I'd have to be in New Jersey, which is a four and a half hour ride for 7 a.m. I would sleep in my bed in Worcester, Mass from 10 p.m. until 2 a.m., wake up, drive four and a half hours straight to the job site. I'd work an eight hour day. I'd go to the gym. And then Friday, I would do the opposite. I'd wake up, hit the gym, work eight hours and drive home. That was my life. I hated it. Like I hated it. The money didn't matter. I didn't care about that anymore. Yeah. And it just kept getting worse. And my attitude was getting bad. And I was getting like a little bit in trouble at work. And nobody liked to work with me because I didn't care about staying late and getting overtime. None of that meant anything to me. And I was just miserable. I gave up all, like a lot of my friendships. It's hard to hold down a relationship when you're never home. Right. Right. So I'm, I'm miserable and I feel like I'm getting away from my purpose. And the worst, this is the, the rock bottom basement moment for me that changed my life forever. Not only in a negative way, but in, I mean, a measurable positive ways. So I'm sitting on the edge of a hotel bed in a crusty room in New Jersey on a cold winter morning. And I'm lacing up my work boots at the edge of the bed. And I just, the best way to explain it is there was like 10 televisions on all at the same time, but they're all on different channels and they're telling me things. And one's saying you're stuck here forever. One saying you'll never leave this job and be able to make the same amount of money you're making. What are your friends going to think? What will your family think? Like, do you really think you can leave this job? And the biggest one, do you really think you can be a successful podcaster? I've dealt with confidence issues my entire life. Do you really think you can be a successful podcaster? Like the chances of that are so slim. And everybody told me that. And here I am sitting on the edge of the bed. And I genuinely thought in that moment that the best thing for me to do would be to kill myself. Because if I ended my life, I ended my problems. Right. And this is a dark, I'm four, I'm four and a half hours away from anybody who loves me in a crusty, dark hotel room on a cold morning, getting ready to head to a job I hate. Like right. this is, this is the mud. Yeah. Now, luckily I had an amazing friend, the guy, this guy here. And uh, he's the co-host of the show now. And his name's Alan. I reached out to Alan on Snapchat and said, Hey man, I'm really struggling. I, I don't know what to do. Like I'm feeling really bad. I'm feeling really trapped. I'm having some dark thoughts. And he said, Kev, you've changed so much over the last couple of years, but your environment hasn't, you know, you're, you're not meant to be doing what you're doing. Yeah. Like you're not meant to be doing that. And I sat with that. I went to work. I didn't, obviously I didn't kill myself. I went to work and two or three months later I left. I left a hundred thousand dollars on the table. I went full-time into podcasting. I went full-time into speaking full-time in, into coaching. And I haven't, I haven't looked back. That was, you know, two and a half or three, three years ago. Dude, that's awesome, man. I, I just, I love the story. I mean, I, I was actually talking, I made a, a vlog this morning where I was parallel on the journey of chasing your vision to the story in the Bible about the Israelites. And when they were enslaved in Egypt, most people know the story of the 10 commandments when they you know they go to the promised land and all that. So God says, Hey, look, I want to take you to this better place where you're not going to be a slave because they were slaves in Egypt. You know, they had security, they had their three square meals, they had a roof over their head, but they had to go through this wilderness period that wasn't all that comfortable. And during that period, that's where they really learned to trust God. Because if you look at, uh, you know, he led them with a, a, a cloud by day, fire by night, manna came down from heaven, which was just bread that came and they could only take one day's worth. They had to learn to trust God for the next day spread. Right. So through this wilderness period, they learned to trust God. And then they, he eventually took them into this promised land, which was this better place where they were living in their purpose. They were doing things besides being a slave. They were doing, you know, some one person was meant to be a farmer and the next person was meant to be a blacksmith and this guy, you know, whatever. So that's where they were fulfilled and they had their own homes and they were free. They were, they had freedom. And I parallel that journey. Like, that's the journey that every single person has to make, mm -hmm. where if you're working a job that you're not happy in, you, you might have your three square meals, you have some security, you get your paycheck on Friday, but you know when you're not living in your purpose because oh, yeah. you feel it. You don't look forward. Sundays or Sunday nights are worse than Friday days. You know, like I used to like Friday morning better than I like Sundays because at least I was looking forward to the weekend. Yep. So like when you're living in your purpose, while it's not always easy, you know, because trusting, trusting God or, you know, in my opinion or is not, it's not comfortable always. Cause you never, you're like, Oh shit, how's this going to work out? Um, but man, there's just nothing like waking up and doing what you were meant to, to do with your life. You know, it's, it's, and we talked about it a little bit in the preamble. It's, it's almost hard to explain in a way, because if you told 25 year old Kevin, what 30 year old Kevin was going to be doing, I don't know that I would have been able to understand it. Mm-hmm. Like I'm getting up earlier now than I ever have in my life, but I love it. 
It's like weird. It's just, I don't have to get up at four, but I like it. It's weird. Because like, you want to get there. That's what I tell is. people. I when I when I was a promote. So like when I was uh, promoting nightclubs, I had this this club. It was like a gimme. It was called the Get Down, and I would make about a thousand dollars a month. I really didn't even have to do much besides show up. And when I knew that I just wasn't supposed to do that anymore, I, I quit and people were shocked because they're like, it's such a great gig. Like, why would you walk away from that? And I had no backup plan at all. Nothing that I knew I was going to do to make money. But I just knew I couldn't do that anymore and, and go after the goal. So I just walked away from it. And, you know, I know a little bit about your story, how you downsized. I think you said you rented a place for like 500 bucks a month. I, I moved in with my best friend. Yeah. Who's I, also chasing dreams. And it's amazing how like you can go from making six figures, which is what you were making to probably making zero. A, lot, a lot less than that, right? Zero. And you were probably a hell of a lot happier. Yeah. I remember people ask me like, what does it feel like to be in alignment? And how did you like, how are you happier when you were broke? And I said, I had this moment where I was, my buddy works for a government contractor. He was, he was out, he was at work and I was at home by myself. And I was walking around the kitchen and I don't know how to explain it, Rob, but like, I just was happy with who I was for the first time in my life. Mm. I had like $400 in the bank like, and my rent was 500. So I was in a bit of trouble, but it was like, I felt aligned. I felt on purpose for the, for the first time in my life. And I think so many people are living by accident. Yeah. And that was, that was me. So I have so much empathy for that. It's my goal to help people realize like, just because you see me on this show in the studio, 470 episodes, a couple businesses, I literally had no idea that I was going to do any of this five years ago. So right, you're right. five years, a year, a month, a week, a day from something new, but you got to start, you got to start somewhere. That's so good, man. So intentionality, that was what I was thinking about, you know, when you were just talking, that's one of the, the, core values of city fam. It's like beginning with the end in mind, mm. you know, I was, how do you, how do you figure out like, so you kind of, did you stumble across podcasting with, with Alan? Uh, so I was interviewed. Alan had a show mm -hmm. with his, his buddy. They interviewed me. Alan was in the bathroom. I was hanging out with my other buddy. I said, imagine if you could do that for a living. And he said, you know, you can, right. I ordered the stuff the next day. I spent like 600 or $700 on gear and that was it. I never, I never looked back. So it was kind of, it was revealed to me, but looking back, you can't connect the dots moving forward. You can only connect them when you're, when you look back, I always loved radio talk shows, mm -hmm. like listening in the car. I used to say, imagine if your job was to show up and talk on the microphone for four hours. I love that. And Joe Rogan is a huge hero of mine. So when you connect those two, they kind of make sense of like, well, maybe that's, you know, you're, your soul, your intuition telling you that maybe that's what you would be either good at or interested in doing. Yeah. Cause I think that that is probably what hangs a lot of people up. Cause I'm sure there's going to be people listening to this and they're going to be like, damn, you know, like, I wish I could do that. I wish I could jump, you know, but what, maybe they don't know what to jump for. For me, it was, it was like, I, I had an idea of what it was. I knew it had something to do with social and, helping people become better versions of themselves, overcome boredom, something like that. So I just started like promoting these little events called clean that were in bars that were like, uh, I actually found three Christian bands and I found three bar bands and I would tell the Christian bands, okay, don't, don't be too churchy. Cause I don't want to offend, offend these guys. And I would tell the, the other bar bands, Hey, don't cuss too much. Cause I don't want to offend the church people. And it would create this interesting dynamic of people that were like, you know, in church that were bored and then people that were maybe looking to become a better, it was just a cool dynamic, but it was through those things that it really started to get revealed to me. And I tell a lot of people, a lot of times, like, if you have an idea what it is, just start, just move because like God can't steer a parked car. So you just have to get, you have to try things. You have to try different things until you, you find it. And in your case, you know, that you kind of like stumbled across it. Yeah. And then, you, you know, when you, when you know, when you, feel, you come across it, you'll feel it, you'll know it. There'll be some check in your gut, you know, you gotta is, love it. That yeah. like, if you don't love what you're doing, this is the thing. And I see this with podcasters all the time. They start a podcast to, with an end goal. Like if you're starting something with the end goal of ending it, don't start something so you can end it. If right. you don't love it, you won't last. 
in business or in entre- like in any entrepreneurial endeavor, you won't last because when it gets hard, which it will, you're going to say like, ah, this kind of sucks. Like right. again, and I tell people this all the time. I always want to be transparent and I want to be authentic and I don't want people to see the highlight reel. Like I yeah. try to be as real as I can. It took me two years to make money in podcasting. It just did. It, it took a long time. So mm. if I didn't love this, I would have left. I would have right. said like, ah, I'll go. It's not just about the money. It can't be just about the money. You have yeah. mastery, impact, and money. For me, like I love impacting. The ability to do a speech in front of a college and have a bunch of students reach out and for me to have the time to send them one-on-one videos and like help them, that is unreal. Like I am so blessed to have that as my existence, as my life. The money, sure, that comes too, right? right. Like if it's only about the money, you'll never get to that actual result. So it's, it's, you'll quit before you get there. No, I love that, man. I actually have sent people that video on YouTube. What if money didn't matter? Hmm. It's like, you, you know, I think even Steve Jobs said the only way to, to do great work is you have to, you know, requires long hours if you're going to start something. And if you don't love it, you'll quit. Yeah. Because it's just, it's just so hard to build it. So I think that is really important is really, you have to start with why, you know, like what, and a lot of times I think that, that even that why has to do with what you've been through in the past. Um, my buddy, Billy Lofton used to say, show me your past and I'll show you your future. Mm. You know, like, so if you've been through something and it was difficult, then, um, you know, usually you want to kind of solve that problem. Yeah. One of our mentors is Evan Carmichael. He says, your, your purpose comes from your deepest pain. I believe that more than I ever have more than I ever have. I believe that. Right. So talk, uh, talk a little bit about uh, what, uh, what are your tips for becoming the best version of yourself? That was actually one of the main reasons I wanted to bring you on the show, because that is kind of one of the taglines that we use in city fam. I would say, honestly, number one, become aware, like be honest with yourself. Like what are parts of you that you either, what don't you like about yourself? In order to become the best version of yourself, you have to take the worst parts and improve them. So number one, become radically honest with yourself. What don't you like? Is it your temper? Okay, we can fix that. Is it your insecurities? Okay, we can fix that. I think the first step in overcoming anything is becoming aware of it. Mm. And I think that's what a lot of people hide from. I think a lot of people hide from the truth. They don't want feedback from themselves or other people. That's, that's number one. Number two, change your group. Like change your group. If you're spending time around people who do not care about bettering themselves, the odds of you bettering yourself are going to be way less. If you hang out with four smokers, there's a good chance you become the fifth, right? Like, unfortunately we are herd creatures and we do what it takes to fit in with the herd. But if you, if you switch the herd, you'll probably switch your behaviors. A great example of this. We, so before we had a team and we had people that were working with us, it was just Alan and myself and a young lady named Amy reached out to Alan and her and I started chatting as well. And she said, Hey, I'm afraid becoming aware and admitting, I am afraid to go up to somebody and start a conversation. I said, Amy, that's awesome. Me too. That sucks. Let's go to the mall Thursday, meet me at the mall and we'll approach strangers. Okay. I was terrified. Didn't want to do this at all, but this is my purpose. I have to do this. So we went, we approached strangers. We went into the stores. We asked them about certain things. By the end of the time, she was walking up to people and having conversations. Before we left, they had these motorized zoo animals and we rode them around the mall. She didn't think she could talk to somebody. And here she is not caring about people judging her. She ended up becoming part of our team. Now she works with us. She just went and finished her Uh, physical therapy assistant school that she didn't think she could do. Her life is completely different now because she was aware she admitted something and then she got around a different group of people. Like if you could only do two things, yeah, that would be it. And then like learning, learn. If, If the last time you read a book was in school, that is a problem for your future because the knowledge you have has gotten you as far as it's going to get you. It's not going to get you any further right? You ha- the more knowledge you have, the more opportunity you have. So if I had to give you three, I would say those three probably. Yeah. Two of the three things is, you know, they said you'll be the same person five years from now, except for the uh, people that you meet and the books that you read. I don't know if you've heard that saying, but I, I definitely agree with both of those things. I'm, I'm a huge advocate of uh, the, the power of community to change lives. That's actually our mission statement at City Fams is changing lives through the power of community mm-hmm. because 
I see, you know, for, <laughs> in my own life, when I hung around shitty people, I became shittier. Yeah. When I hung around good people, I became better. You know, you absolutely pick up people's habits. So that, that is a hundred percent true. I think the mistake that I see, you know, people make is they want to change and they, they think that they don't have to cut off the relationships. Like they think that they're, oh, I don't want to leave, leave her or him because they need my help. And I'm like, look, it's like crabs in a bucket. When I changed my life, I had to cut everybody off. And then I had to, I had to fix me. And then now that I had a new community, I could go back for them and pull them up one by one. But if you're trying to get better in the midst of them, forget it. You'll never make it out. John, I was listening to one of John Maxwell's books and he was talking about lifters versus leaners. And this is the best way. Everybody asks me about like, well, how do you decide who's right for you and your friends and your relationships? And I always had trouble answering that question because I don't ever want to tell somebody like, look, you got to get rid of your friends. I don't want to tell people that. I think you should reallocate time and see what happens. Right. But John Maxwell says there's lifters and there's leaners. There's people that constantly are lifting up other people. They're trying to lift up the community. They're trying to impact and contribute greater than themselves. Then there's the leaners, the people who are always either looking for a handout or looking, you know, they don't know what to do. So they try to pull from you. Now, don't get me wrong. I've been a leaner there. I'm sure sometime this month I was a leaner when I was struggling. Don't get me wrong. That's going to happen, but you have to go with, you have to base it off the evidence from the past, from the current and your best understanding of the future. This mm. person always calls me for advice. I give them great advice in my opinion. They never seem to take it. And they're always asking me the same questions. Like, what should I do? That person's probably a leaner. I'm right. sorry to say it. But if somebody who is always there for you, who is trying to do something amazing, just lost a family member, they might be a leaner for a little bit. That's normal. Everybody right. has peaks and valleys, but it's the people who are always leaning that unfortunately, it's a decision. You either decide it's best for my long term to, to kind of distance myself, or I'm okay with losing something in my future to keep this person in my life now. Like, yeah. it's, it's kind of like that. It's, you know, it's such a tough decision because I've been in those places where, like, I've had people in my life that drain me. And I, I have such a heart for people. I see potential. I always want to, you know, try to help people get to the best version of themselves and, and really just be, you know, self actualize. And, you know, like these people that drain me, I would continue to extend myself, extend myself. And then I had to realize, like, look, there's a lot of people in the world that need help. Right. And if this person isn't, you know, if you're not seeing progress in their life, then it might be time to kind of sever that relationship or at least love them from a distance, you know, and I've had to make that decision a few times. And honestly, it's probably one of the best decisions I made because as much as I love people, if people don't want help and they're not willing to do the work, it's like, you can't really do anything for them. Yeah. You know, imagine like if you were a personal trainer and you're telling people how to lift and and eat right, but they don't do it. You're never going to be able to get them into the shape that they need to be. They have to do the work. You can't do someone's pushups for them. And I think understanding if you're the one that's distancing, understand that the people probably are not going to understand. Like they're not going to understand why you're doing, uh, doing it. They're going to take it personally. And honestly, I'm sure I would too, but yeah. I, I, that's something I've come across a lot of like, I don't even know how to explain it. I I'm just, I regret it. I'm sorry that it has to be this way, but like, you know, I have opportunities to spend time with people who are in my industry or clients. Like right. I have people that pay me to help them. Now, don't get me wrong. I still help people for free all the time, but if I do that forever, yeah, I'll end up back where I was before with no money. Like you have to, it's, it seems selfish. Like a lot of what I do probably seems selfish to people who are watching. If they knew how selfless it actually was. Right. Sure. But the problem is Rob, they don't until you're Oprah. And it's right. like, Oh, that's why you were doing that. the whole. And, time. Oh, and he, and even she gets accused. So of course. everybody does. Everybody. <laughs> so does. What do you, where do you tell people to find better people? Because if they want to, let's say they want to change their friends, you know, where do you tell them to find the, this better class of people? Yeah. Before COVID, I would have said any, any networking event. That like, and we've changed the name in our minds and in our community's minds to relationship building. Networking has a bad rap, understandable. Like, you know, if you're going in there and your intention is to sell somebody versus to make 
a relationship or a connection, that's number one. Like if you have, and again, th that part isn't necessarily COVID proof, but when COVID goes away, there is an app called Meetup. You can literally go do a meetup with people who like the same exact things you do. Perfect. There's a million Zoom things now. Mm -hmm. We have a mastermind every Monday, right? Every single Monday, we have a live mastermind where we tell people to come in. Groups like yours, yeah. that's another great place. Any community, and it doesn't have to be in person. That's the beautiful thing about what's going right. on now. There are so many opportunities. You can reach out to your favorite influencer on Instagram. Yeah. You can go to your favorite influencer on Instagram, look at who follows them, and pick some, somebody out and message them and say, hey, John, I saw that you also like Tom Bilyeu. I absolutely love Tom Bilyeu. I'd love to hop on the phone sometime and maybe pick your mind on business and see if I can add value, uh, value on podcasting. Boom, you just made a new connection. Sure. But it's getting out of your comfort zone enough to realize like, look, you're going to have to get out of your, you're going to have to fear chase a little bit. It's, it's hard making new friends, right? That's why most people keep the friends that they had from, from middle school and kindergarten. But- this is, and this is a question that I ask people at the beginning of my speeches. Are the people in your life the best from your past or the best for your future? Mm, that good. is the question. And it's the hardest question to answer. But again, awareness is, is step one. Yeah, that's good. I had a question. I just lost it. Um, so let's, okay, let's, let's switch gears a little bit. So how would you define success? Oh man. So it's interesting because success to me is what I'm doing now, but exponential. So we break things down into health, wealth, and love. And every single day I have a spreadsheet where I go through and I track the things that are most important to me. So, you know, my yeah. relation. Go ahead. I'd love for you to talk about those things. So I heard you on the uh, one percenter podcast mention sure. those, those 12 things. Yeah. Yeah. So it might be more now since then, because now I have another business and that's a whole thing. But just for example, if you're listening to this, I would break your life up into health, wealth, and love. So for me, health, uh, either go to the gym or do yoga every day, foam roll and mobility every day, tracking calories, which I haven't been doing. I'll admit that I'm, I'm just trying to gain weight, right? Drinking water. You will almost never see me without water. My goal is to drink 96 ounces a day right? Those are, those are some health ones. Also meditation. Meditation is something I do every single day, meditation or breath work. Okay. So let's just say that's health. Wealth, track my finances every single day. Every single day, I try to reach out to a new person. I try to build a relationship for business every single day. Also, what was the other one? Oh, learning. Yeah. 40 minutes every single day, 40 minutes of an audiobook every single day. If you're driving, perfect time to listen to an audiobook. If you're foam rolling, cooking, dishes, laundry, anything, right? Yeah. There's, there, that's a perfect time. So wealth is anything that helps you keep track of the money you have or to make more. Mm -hmm. And then love. This is self-love, friendships, intimate relationships, team, whatever it may be. Okay. So for me, it's Gratitudes with my girlfriend. Every single night before we go to bed, we say what we're grateful for with each other. We also have questions we ask each other. Did you feel loved? Did you feel listened to? Did you feel supported? Did you feel appreciated? What do you need from me? And then we do a weekly check-in where we go deeper into the five love languages, the six basic human needs, right? And then, so that's relationship love. And then self-love. I have my journal right here next to me. Just, it's positive affirmations. I am the best podcaster I can be. I am becoming the best speaker I can be, right? I'm, I'm trying to create a, a positive environment. So if you're listening, literally, it could be track finances, exercise for 30 minutes a day, tell your significant other one thing you're grateful for about, or tell yourself one thing you're grateful for. That's awesome. I mean, you know, I, I look at the routine that I follow because I'm very, um, you know, I'm a creature of habit for sure. And it, you know, you bodybuild it. So you'll, you'll get the reference, but I look at like, so I competed in my early twenties at a couple shows and you know, you have to get down to like four or 5% in order to step on stage and not embarrass yourself. So it was very much like contest prep in that, you know, I was, I saw my dietitian. he's like, okay, measure you test your body fat. Okay. We're going to increase your cardio by 10 minutes in the morning. We're going to drop your, 
you know, your oatmeal, we're going to cut a quarter cup of oatmeal in the morning. I like, it was like, he just dialed you in. So when I look at my, my routine that I follow, you know, I'm like, okay, I just kind of measure my results. And I'm like, how am I doing? How am I, how, how are my emotions? Um, and then I'll be like, okay, uh, I need to get up 30 minutes earlier, or I need to start reading the book, you know, like a little bit more, I need to add this in or that in, I, you know, like, and it's, you just dial yourself into whatever your ideal life is. I mean, you, you made a great point there, Rob. Emotions versus logic. Mm. Logically, well, emotionally, it's almost impossible, impossible just emotionally to get down to 4% body fat. Like it's, it's not good for you. It's not healthy. It's the opposite of everything your body needs, but logically you can override emotion, right? Like ice cream. I really love ice cream right now. Also, I'm going to be sloppy when I step on stage and I'm going to make a fool of myself. Yeah. Logic versus emotion. I think that when it comes to creating a system of success, that's what we call that. Most people are going off their emotions. So they wake up and grab their phone and check social media emotion, right? Yeah. They don't go to the gym after a long day because emotionally they're drained. They're not logicking. Well, this is going to get me closer to my goal. I'll actually feel better after. That's such a huge thing. And I am guilty of that too. When I get overwhelmed, sometimes I'm just like, I just emotion. I just listen to my emotions and don't do anything. Mm. But if you can get, understand yourself, what are your responses to overwhelm, to stress, to insecurity, to fear? Because it's going to be emotional. And if you live your life only making emotional decisions, you, you probably won't get what you logically want. It doesn't line up that way. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it starts with, like when you mentioned the contest, you know, you're doing things that you don't want to do for, you know, several weeks, 12 weeks, whatever it is, because you're thinking about the pain that would be associated with you getting up and embarrassing yourself. Right. right? So you're like, <laughs> you know, I don't want to get laughed off the stage. So like, it's almost got to be like, you get so clear on what your vision is for your life that it's painful not to attain it. You know, cause like you said, getting up at four o'clock in the morning, you know, it's not, I tell people, it's not that you're not a morning person. It's that your vision isn't clear. Mm -hmm. Because if your vision's clear, you'll do anything. You'll run through a wall if you had to, yeah. to get there because you just, it becomes a burning desire in you that you have to get done. Or it just it's like, literally, I, sometimes I, I feel like it's painful because I haven't gotten there yet. It's like a splinter in my brain that I have to, you know, pull out. Um, but I do think that that is something that that's missing from people is they, when you don't have that clear vision, which is so, so important for, you know, becoming the best version of yourself, because it forces you to like do things that you would have never even thought you were capable of. Yeah. You know, I think it work. goes to belief too. I think the problem with a lot of people is I think your vision and clarity can only be as good as your belief. Mm. Right. Because yeah, I, I, for a long time, I didn't believe in myself as a podcaster until like 150 episodes in genuinely. So for me to say, I'm going to be the best podcaster in the world, it would have, it would not have made sense. It, like, I can't say that. I don't feel it. I think that Alan and I always talk about this. I think the biggest thing holding people back is lack of belief. He thinks it's too much ego. Those are where we came from. So it makes sense. But I've just seen so many people who don't believe in themselves, who can borrow belief from me or from Alan or from whoever that yeah. actually then take action. That's the only, not the only, but one of the biggest reasons I'm where I am is because I have Alan on my side. Alan yeah. has the most belief out of anybody I've ever met in my entire life, ever. It's not even close. And I had zero. So I borrowed his belief long enough and now I have my own. Yeah. And if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't have yeah, a business. So good. It's so important. Yeah, it's so good. Like I know what I wanted to say earlier was when I asked you about where do you find better people to surround yourself. One of the things I tell people is volunteer because when you, when you volunteer, you build relationships with people that are less selfish than the rest of the world. Cause they're there giving of themselves with no thought of themselves. And those people will come in very useful to you as you start to realize what's your vision for your life is because you're going to need things. You're going to need advice. You're going to need support, help somebody to like buy your, buy your whatever, or, you know, volunteer for whatever you're going to need help. And if you volunteer, you'll have the friends in your corner to do it. But also like what I've noticed within city fam is when people get around other people that are pursuing their goals and chasing their dreams, 
it is contagious. So like I see, like even with you, with Alan, you know, he's got this confidence and it just spills over onto you or you yeah. start to believe in yourself. And it really goes back to everything that you said with like surrounding yourself with just a better class of people. Yeah. And yeah. it's almost, this is the problem. If you lack belief, you don't like people who believe in themselves because it comes yeah. off as arrogant. It can, if they do it the wrong yeah. way, you actually need the opposite of what you are. We call it the drive to five. And this is like, I don't know if you can call it a law, but we have seen this so many times. Alan was a 10. He was arrogant. I was a zero. I was insecure. Drive to five. Confident but humble. Right? Most people, I think, most people are closer to zero. They're probably around a two or a three range. They're yeah. not very, most people aren't that confident because of whatever it is, the way they were raised, social media, whatever it may be. But yeah. you have to figure out a way, like, you can add value to somebody else who is better than you at something. Just figure out what that value is. For, for Alan and I, it was, I helped him be more vulnerable. I've always been vulnerable. Like, you know, it's easy for me to say a lot of the things I say because I believe it'll help somebody at a deep level. He brought mental strategy. I brought emotional vulnerability. And now we're both becoming the best versions of ourselves. We both have our dream relationships we wouldn't be able to do what we are doing without each other. It's genuine. Like it's the most incredible gift in the world. Genuinely. That's awesome. So tell me about the, okay. The podcast before you renamed it, it's called the hyperconscious. Oh yeah. Podcast. Where did that name come from? What does it mean to you to be hyperconscious? That was literally the night I was lying in bed after I had my six figure check. I literally said, I am living unconsciously. Like I am, t I don't even know what I'm doing. What is the polar opposite of that? Hyperconscious. That, that is where that came from. That name stuck. And I went all in on that. What that means is acutely aware. You understand at a deep level why things are the way they are. And if you don't, you're trying to understand why you don't know why things are the way they are. So specifically, we talk about yourself. Like, know yourself. What are you afraid of? Like, this is a question I love to ask. On a scale of one to 10, how happy are you with your body, your relationship, and your bank account? How happy are you actually? Like when you look in the mirror, when you check your bank account, when you're, when you're really thinking about your relationship, not talking to your, your friends about like, oh, he's so awesome or she's amazing. How happy are you really? Yeah. And if you can answer those questions 10 out of 10, amazing, right? Amazing. But if you don't, then you have to be hyper-conscious in figuring out, okay, what's the next step? Is this the right career? Am I doing the right things with my body? When am I going to start? Is this relationship right for me? Will it ever be? Yeah, that's great. So I, I actually have a, an online course that I developed called Unleash the Best You. And the, one of the first, actually the first exercise I have people do is write their own eulogy. Mm. Because, uh, so I did several coaching programs when I was, you know, over the last nine years, actually, but specifically when I was really making the changes, I did a couple programs and it just impacted me so, um, so much that I, I wanted to make it accessible to other people. And, uh, the number, I think the number one regret of the dying, according to this book, Bronnie wears, we, that, we interviewed her. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Dude, I'd love to talk to her. Um, but yeah, it's not living a life true to myself, yep. you know? So, so many people, I think that was the most common regret of people when they're going to their, their grave is they didn't, they weren't even aware of, like you said, they weren't conscious of who they were and what they were created to do, or they didn't have the faith, which again, goes back to what you just said to step out and go after it, because that, that really is the key. Uh, you, you're right about that because you might, you might have an idea of what it is, but if you don't think you're going to be successful, you won't step out because you just won't believe that it, it's possible. Yeah. Um, but the other thing I have people do is a balance wheel where they identify the eight priority areas of their life and they rate themselves on a scale of one to 10 to see where they're at and see where they have flats. But yeah, I think you're spot on. It goes back to like, where's your starting point? Where are you at right now? You know, what do you need to work on? And, and hopefully the goal with that eulogy, um, exercises to really just to kind of wake people up like, Hey, this day is coming. You know, one day someone is going to give your eulogy. Do you, are they able to say this about you right now? Yeah. It's, I, I just feel like, and I was guilty of this. I used to have a very fixed mindset. I didn't understand that I could change things about myself. And I didn't realize that was a thing. I didn't know that I was never really taught that. Yeah, so same. for me, right. It's like, and I think that Alan and I are playing for something different than a lot of people. Like 
I want to be the best podcaster I can be and a speaker, but honestly, I want to be the best man. I, yeah. And I mean that like Alan and I have cried on car rides because we have some junk that we have to get rid of, uh, get rid of. I've cried at things I've said to people in the past. Like I hold myself to a very high standard when it comes to the man I am, because that's more than anything. That's what I want at my eulogy, mm-hmm. whatever. Maybe I'm not going to be the most successful podcaster or I'm not going to be a billionaire, but I want people to say like, honestly, he was one of the, the best men I ever met in my entire life. Like if that's what I get, I'm okay with that. I'm more than okay with that. Yeah, that's great. I love big goals. You know, like I've, I have some huge, uh, I have a huge definite major purpose that I got from thinking grow rich for myself, because if you shoot for something that's that high, I want to be the best podcaster in the world. Even if you pull short, you right. know, and you make the top 100, I'll I mean, take, that's I'll still, damn good, right? you know, um, but uh, what's I going to mention? Okay. I keep losing my thought, but let, let's go into uh, the, the part you mentioned. Oh, no, I know what I want to talk about. You mentioned in a, a podcast that I'd heard an interview that you did. It might've been with Sam. I don't remember, but you, you were raised in a single, single parent home, right? Yeah. Same yep. for me. My mom was 14 when she got pregnant with me. Dad was never in the same state or paid child support. So when you mentioned, I was never taught this stuff and, you know, I want to be the best man, like, who modeled that for you when you were a kid? Like what, what it meant to be a man. Did you have someone? No, not really. No, I, and honestly, it almost seems like a detriment, but I think it's what has made me good with, I used to have a real bad temper, but I never really like, I don't know. I think it's easier for me to be vulnerable because I was raised by women Mm -hmm. and I saw what femininity was Mm -hmm. Uh, in turn. Like I was always, the kid who went over people's houses and they like, I would stay for dinner. I would go on trips with them and looking back, it was awesome. But I also feel like maybe it was a little bit of charity, but I love it. I love the fact that they were thinking of me. So I would just say my friends' dads were the only thing I really had to, to model after and maybe my uncles, but you know, my family, a lot of my family has been in trouble in the past. We'll just leave it at that. So I'm trying to kind of, get rid of that. I don't, sure. don't want to, I don't want to keep that going. So I don't really know, to be honest, I, I don't really think I had that many people to model. I think Dang. I just, yeah, I decided I mean, like, I want to be an example that maybe that's what it is. I want my, one of my deepest pains is not having a dad. I remember in middle school, what does your dad do for a living? I used to just say construction. I didn't even know my dad's name. Hmm. I didn't even know what his name was. I didn't even know what he looked like until I met him. Right. I had no idea. He, I could have seen him before. I wouldn't have even known it. Wow. And that was one of my deepest pains. So I think I want people to see me and be like, oh, wow, like that exists. Like that kind of awesome guy who's vulnerable, but strong, but funny, but serious, but joking, but intellectual. Like that person exists. I think I want to be an example for other people. Yeah. No, I, it was the same for me where I was, I would hang out with my friends that had dads, yeah. and, you know go to the BMX track or, or whatever camping with them. But I think that that also is what led me to a similar place that you were where, you know, I bought into the lies of the world where, you know, had the hot girlfriend, bodybuild it, was popular, made a lot of money. All my worth was tied up in that. That's what I, cause that's what, that's what television and the movies, which is really what taught me how to be a man told me it meant. And then of course you realize it's all bullshit. You know, it doesn't fulfill you, you know, then you got to go out and relearn everything. So, um, so I'm curious to talk a little bit about the suicidal thoughts that you had. How did having emotional intelligence help you with battling those? Honestly, I look back and I feel like I was kind of lucky because I tell my story and that's my rock bottom moment. That wasn't the first time I debated suicide. Like I, I remember I lived in Boston with my girlfriend. We lived in this unreasonably nice apartment with another couple and everybody was gone one day. And I was just laying in bed thinking like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Like I'm tired. I'm hopeless. I'm lost. I'm not passionate about everything. Like I literally, I didn't want to kill myself, but I didn't want to be alive. I would have been okay if I just kind of like faded away. So honestly, and this, this might be the best point of it, I guess. I wasn't afraid to ask for help. That, that is like, that is the biggest thing. I told my girlfriend and she suggested therapy. I went to therapy 
learned about myself, that made me be a little bit more vulnerable. So in terms of emotional intelligence, when it comes to that specific, I think the only thing was me asking for help, whether it's Alan or whether it was my girlfriend at the time saying, hey, I, I don't know what's going on, but I don't feel good. People right. were there and they, they led me with a clear mind and they took emotion out of it and said, logically, this is what you should do. I don't think it was, honestly, I don't think it was really me. I think it was the people around me. Yeah, that's good. But I mean, the biggest takeaway is, yeah, get some help. Be willing to be vulnerable and share, you know. I think, uh, you know, it's so it's so endearing too when someone isn't afraid to talk about their struggles. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I heard you talk about, you know, your girlfriend left you because you didn't have sex drive after your bodybuilding show. And then you would kind of broadcast that. I'm like, it's pretty cool. You know, uh, no, this is a, this is what I always want to do, especially if, if men are listening, I used to be addicted to porn. Yeah. You know how many guys are that won't admit that almost all of them that like, it just is that way. Yeah. But I see the way it's trending. You can literally get Cialis delivered to your door without a prescription. So the need to not be addicted is going away. Right. right? Like that's going to be a problem. I'm telling you that is going to be an epidemic in the next, you know, five to 10 years. That's why I tell people, look, I dealt with that. I used to be addicted to porn. Like the first time I saw that was when I was like six years old, seven years old. So that has been following me around. Sure. I feel like at the end of the day, we all have something unique that isn't as unique as we think. Right. It's only unique until you tell somebody you realize, oh, okay, this is actually something that happens fairly often, yeah. but it, it'll, it'll always be unique and it'll be your secret until it's not. Yeah. It's, it's so wild how the devil, you know, the enemy has convinced everyone that yours is so unique. Like, no, like the, the word says, you know, all temptation is common to man, you know, basically it's basically like we're all dealing with the same shit, yeah. you know, everybody's tempted the same way. We're all dealing with the same things. And we, the word says, that you get freedom. It says, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So there's a, there's a principle there that if you speak it out, you tell somebody, Hey, this is what I'm struggling with. And they pray for you, then you can get past it. But when you keep it quiet, you can't get past it. It's, yeah. you know, the, even so they say in the program, you're only sick, sick as your secrets, but it's, it's interesting how, you know, like everybody thinks theirs is worse. <laughs> yeah. I can't tell anybody because people will think I'm really bad. Hey. You know, but you got to You got to speak it out. And it's so rare because most people won't. Most people won't share. Hey, I'm addicted to porn. You know, like, but that, that's awesome, man. I, I I try to be really transparent and vulnerable, you know, through my vlogs. I try to document the journey of, you know, even the bad parts, the ugly parts. Um, you got to. Yeah. It, and it, what it does is, is it makes people, it, it's endearing, you know, because they, everybody's struggling, you know, with the same, for the most part, they're struggling with the same yeah. things or a version of the same thing. Yeah. And I, the actually, go ahead. I was going to say, the problem is like, I could take a picture in front of a Ferrari. That's not mine. And you'll think I'm the man, right. but like what true strength is, is having the capability of showing your weakness. I'm convinced of that. It's not yeah. sexy and it's not going to like, you know, you're not going to blow up overnight because of it, but like, it's truth. You have to live in your truth. You can't yeah. you can fake it for so long. I made a video last week where I was talking about a struggle I had and somebody called me and they're like, man, I respect that. I respect you so much. They're like, I can't do it because they, they have this persona. They have this business where they have to project themselves as being, you know, living their best life, let's say. And they can't say they're struggling in this area because it would, and I say, look, man, you don't know what will come of it. Right. You just got to be honest and share it. And you don't know, it could lead to something that you completely can't see right now. So, but I, I do want to introduce you to a friend of mine named Frank Rich. I don't know if you know Frank, he's in Florida. He has a podcast where he's helping men overcome porn addiction. Oh, okay. I'm sure, I'm sure he would love to interview you. Sure, sure. I love it. But tell everybody what, um, what you're working on, what do you have coming up, what you're excited about, and then how they can connect with you. Sure. So we literally just rebranded to Next Level University. We drop five episodes a week, four solo episodes, and one with high quality guests, David Meltzer, Dean Graziosi, Evan Carmichael. Ronnie Ware, uh, so many amazing people. We have, we have an amazing network of people and we have amazing mentors. We're so blessed when it comes to that. Uh, we're rebranding our website. We're going to have online courses and all that happy jazz. But I have an, a podcast um, solution service called Podstrong. That is my main focus other than Next Level University right now. We help busy CEOs and entrepreneurs with their podcasts. We literally run it so you guys don't have to. 
you can go out and do the business deals. You can do the speeches. You can do whatever it is. We take care of the rest. So if you have a podcast and or want to start one and don't know where or don't have the time, that is our specialty. And that is one of the things that I'm really focused on right now. That's awesome. So how can people connect with you? Should they do it through Instagram or email or what? Yeah, you can do Instagram. You can do Kevin at the hyperconsciouspodcast.com. That'll be changing, but that'll be up for a while. Uh, but Instagram, never quit kid. Uh, if you follow me, if you send me a message, I will get back to you. I try to send videos to everybody. So that is one of my, my favorite things to do. That's awesome. I'll put all the links in the show notes. Appreciate for everybody. It. But yeah, man, it was great catching up. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you, man. I appreciate you reaching out. I appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate the questions. All right, Kevin. 